Hello, BookTube. I thought it would be fun to do a tag today since today is Tuesday. And I can use the tag Tuesday thing. This is a tag that's been around for a while. I saw it come up again today from Michael K. Vaughn. Originated by... A Web of Stories. I'll, of course, link to, to A Web of Stories. And, and to Michael K. Vaughn. Um... I don't even, oh yeah, I do subscribe to Melinda at Web of Stories. Okay, great, good. Okay, so I haven't done this one before because every time I see it come up, I'm hungry and I don't want to think about cookies. But this time I just finished eating. I had a big lunch. So, a good time to do the Girl Scout cookie tag, which is not about cookies. Some of these I probably can't pronounce the name of. Some I have more than two ideas for some of some of the books I have ideas for uh, fit into more than one category so we'll see how it goes first is the trefoils I have no idea what kind of cookie that is and it's a classic novel that you love uh, for this one I'm going to go with the the chunker of all chunkers the doorstop of all doorstops War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy because I think a lot of people um, are intimidated by it because of the length. In the age of Brando Sando, I, I don't know why anyone would be intimidated by the length of a book, but War and Peace is very accessible compared to, I don't know, say, for example, Crime and Punishment, or certainly compared to something like Finnegan's Wake. It's not a difficult book to read. The names are a little difficult, as I think I've said in other videos about Russian novelists. Uh, there's usually a, a list of character names in the front or the back. Um, it can be a little confusing because there are diminutives and, of, and different people refer to different characters by different names. There's the whole thing with patronyms and all this kind of stuff they do in the Russian language. But uh, you'll get into it and it's you know, you don't need to consult any maps and learn any Elvish or anything like that. It's not that difficult. It's a historical novel. It's written about the Napoleonic era um, and the invasion and the lead up and invasion of Russia by Napoleon. Great cast of characters, very interesting people. It's the wide panorama of life. Um, I mean, there's, there's, most of the characters are from upper class uh, Russians who speak French as their native language. I mean, essentially their native language. They grew up, you know, separated from the peasants, separated from the, this is under feudalism. This is pre-communism. So it's under the, um, the surf system in this era, Russia is. And so most of these characters grow up very separate from their own working class, their own underclasses. They speak French, some of them barely speak Russian. And they're being confronted with what they think is the superior civilization, the superior culture of France about to invade them. So, uh, Many things to recommend about that book. If you just want a big book to involve you with a lot of characters, a great story, that's the one. I mean, if you like Lonesome Dove, if you like Shogun, if you like uh, Game of Thrones, anything, this really fits in with those. Uh, there is there is some philosophy, but not to the... not like reams and reams of it the way you get in, again, Dostoevsky, say, for example, who I also like a lot, but... It's a good read, and it's long, and you'll learn a lot of, and you'll live with these characters a very long time through many decades. Another interesting part about the book that I just, I read this a very long time ago, so I, I uh, and I'll probably never read it again because there's so much to read, but I would like to read it again. One thing that's very interesting about it that's interesting in this time that we live in, but it was also interesting in the time that I lived in when when I first read it, or really any time, is there's this idea of the Antichrist and the people, there's this theory going around that Napoleon is the Antichrist and he's, and this, the end of the world is coming. 
you know, and there's people who are like discovering 666, they're doing numerology on their names and his name. This one character, Pierre Bezuhoff, one of the main characters, very intellectual, middle aged guy, overweight guy, sort of a symbol of uh, Russian uh, complacency, I guess, at the time. You know, he's convinced he's got a destiny and, you know, he does numerology on his own name to try and work it out to 666 too, like, so he, he's the anti-Napoleon and Napoleon is the Antichrist. And, and it's interesting, you know, from any, from the perspective of any other time to see that, especially our time when the end of the world is coming, you know, we think that all the time, the next election is going to end the world. Uh, the might not might have to keep on going, might have to keep on living. You know, just think of all the things that happened in the world after the Napoleonic era that were even much worse. You know, the siege of Stalingrad in World War Two, just just the famines of the of the Russian Revolution, and just on and on and on and on things that don't even enter into the worldview in this novel. So. It really uh, gives perspective that people always think the world is ending. Maybe it isn't. Anyway, let's see what else we got. Okay, number two, Lemon Ups. Those sound good. See, I'm going to get hungry anyway. A book you find inspiring. So I'm going to be more limited on this. There was a few. I really like Michael K. Vaughn's answer on this. Um, so go watch that video, which I've linked to below. And... Is a really good way of thinking of it. I'm going to be a little more limited in my thinking of it and say the book called, it's a style guide, it's called Clear and Simple as the Truth by two co-authors, one French and one uh, British or American, I think. Maybe they're both French. Um, it's about a style that the, 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 the two guys wrote the book called Classic Style writing style and it's just a thrilling book to read about writing and you know, mentions many great writers in there that you'll enjoy reading that he, that he that they use as examples about a certain style of writing which is which is informal it's mostly for nonfiction I think they have some fiction examples too in in informal uh casual uh, respects the reader treats the reader as the intellectual equal of the writer and the only really difference between the writer and the reader is that the writer has some information to to impart that the reader hasn't doesn't happen to have but the reader is smart enough to understand if they already knew it so that's part of it. It's a book that just when I've read, I've read it a few times over the years. It, it gets me really excited about writing. Gets me really excited about reading different writers and stuff. And it just makes me love and appreciate good writing even more than I do before. So that's why I would call that book inspiring. Next is S'mores, a comforting book. I'm gonna scan ahead and make sure I'm not doubling up here. Okay, because I almost did this for inspiration. I got in insects in here, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say for a comforting book, I'm gonna say A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I almost put it for inspiration, because it is very inspiring. Because the character of Scrooge, by examining his his own life, you know, the ghosts don't really make him do anything. They show him his own life. They they put him through a series of of situations where he can analyze himself and he becomes a better person for it and you know uh, you know the way the last paragraphs are written it's clear that he remains that way for the rest of his life he b becomes a good man really through self-reflection and the aid of a few friendly ghosts and it is comforting me to me for that reason too because uh, you know it's just a happy story uh, with a happy a really happy ending about a happy as a, an ending as you can you can hope for and it, 
you know, it's a it's a ghost story. It's a cozy kind of ghost story because there's a little bit of danger. There's a little bit of tension and fear, but you know, of course, we know how well it's going to turn out. So it's fun to read every year. I used to read it every year at Christmas or try to. Um, so I find it very comforting. The language, of course, is very wonderful. It's just nice to be, uh, you know, re revisiting those sentences of of Dickens, you know, which is so familiar after a few readings. And I got to... So that was S'mores, a comforting book. Adventure Fools, an adventurous book. Okay. I was going to say the Horatio Hornblower books, but what I like even more, and I guess I, I'm going to count these as adventures. They're, they're military books, so maybe they're... I guess the I'm going to count them as adventure books. They're they're there's they're still Napoleonic Wars era thing. The Sharp novels by Bernard Cornwell. I love them. I wish there were more. He kept writing and writing and writing and writing and writing them forever. And you know, even after he finished them, he went back and and did prequels and he stuck a few in between. I wish he kept doing that because I love them so much. And I, some of his other series I haven't gotten into as much, although I've tried to, but. Uh, Richard Sharp is a, a great character who rises from, you know, just working class streets of London to to be a sergeant all the way up to lieutenant colonel. Very hard thing to do in the in the British uh, army at that time. You know, really, frankly, impossible to do without money to buy a commission. And you know, it was it was a class based system. But you know, that's part of the fun of it. Richard Sharp is, uh, has got his own moral code and and yeah, his, uh, his, his which is usually higher than most other people's. He's he's kind of an anti-hero. He he'll definitely go outside the chain of command. Let's put it that way. If he thinks he's in the right, he'll do what he thinks is right. And his moral code is is closer to ours than, than to the people around him because he's like, you know, he doesn't look down on people because of their lower class or, and he doesn't automatically respect people because they're higher class, but he also doesn't disrespect people who are of a different class. Like he doesn't just hate all the, all the wealthy people he meets. You know, he judges every man and every woman by their character. Um, alone and I think that's the secret of his likableness as a character because because like I say he'll do he'll do what needs to be done and it's just a, it's very there's some uh, good continuing side characters in there too I really recommend the sharp novels I read when I read a long series like that I like to read them in the order they're written even though there's some out of sequence things like the you know in the first books that were written like I believe probably sharps rifles is probably the first one you know, there's these references back to things he had done when he was stationed in India, like he was illiterate, but then when he was in the Rajah's prison in India, he learned to read. And then later when when Bernard Cornwell actually writes some prequels where Sharp is young and, and in India and a corporal or a private, you know, he has him in prison so he can learn to read and but he's only in prison like a week and a half. So so they have to kind of fit some things back in the other way. But I really like I know some people like to to wait till the series is done and then reorder them, you know, put all the prequels in 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 earlier where they would be chronologically in the character's history. But to me the a character, no matter what year a story is set in, like say a Conan story, you know, where he's the king in one story and he's in his fifties or forties or whatever and then the next story he's eighteen years old and he's barely uh away from home. It's really the development of the writer and the, the writers approach the character that I'm interested in, because they're, they're not gonna. That's how I like to read uh, stories like that, and I think that gets sort of broken up if you try and read all the stories just in chronological order. So that was the Adventure Fools, adventurous book. I will go over the Sharp series. 
let's see the India books, the three India books, which is where where Yark, uh, where Sharp is pretty young. They're the most like adventure like, and you know the rest are about military campaigns and battles and stuff. But he does get involved in side quests and that kind of things. Samoa's number five. Samoa is a book that blends two or more genres. It's really my favorite kind of book. Uh, And it's going to be hard for me. I've been thinking about one for, you know, since I watched this video a little half hour ago or so. I guess I'm going to say, oh, I had a couple good ones. I'm going to go with Isaac Asimov's Cave, Caves of Steel. It's probably, I'm sure I'll think of something better. Uh, it's a mystery at the time. It was written in, I think, the 50s. Asimov was was writing stories, uh, was writing mystery stories as well as science fiction stories at the time. He had this series called The Black Widowers Club, which was this this uh, group, this club of gentlemen intellectuals who solved mysteries in their spare time. And he also wrote Caves of Steel, which is a science fiction novel set in his robot universe, the same... Uh, robotics, law of robotics, iRobot universe. Caves of Steel takes place in a time period where everybody pretty much lives indoors. They don't go out, they just, they're, you know, they, they uh, you know, they, they, they work from home, they, they do, com they project their images out and then robots go out and they do all the work in Caves of Steel because they, can't remember if the cities are underground or anyway the caves of steel are, are the the cities that human beings live in there's also a sequel or maybe that is the sequel i forget what the other book's called now but it's a murder mystery and it's about a cop and a robot who team up to solve the murder mystery and the sort of gimmick is and i just remember the other book i wanted to talk about never mind we'll, we'll go with this one the you know there hasn't been a murder in a very long time because of you know, the way civilization's gone, where people are very, very insular, they don't really interact a lot anymore, and they have technology to solve almost all their problems, and then there's a murder to solve. So that's a mix, because I think a lot of later, there are a lot of science fiction mysteries, and there are a lot of mysteries that have science fiction in them like the J.D. Robb series. I read one of those, it's a, you could read J.D. Robb is a, is a pen name of Nora Roberts, the romance writer. She has a series of futuristic, futuristic mysteries. It's two cops in New York City. But you could read, you know, 350 pages of one of the novels and totally forget that there's, that there's anything about the future in them that, you know, you get jarred. It's like, oh, yeah, like some little thing will happen, like somebody buys a tube of Pepsi instead of a glass, uh, instead of a bottle of Pepsi and think, oh yeah, it's supposed to be in the future because like they don't have any Im improvements in forensics, they have no different laws than we have now everything is exactly the same except it's the future and I've heard that they somehow go to plan different planets in, in any of them but there's just no sense of being in the future and I feel like a lot of quote unquote science fiction uh, mysteries do that, or science fiction writers who try mysteries in their in their fiction sometimes do cheats. Like this is John Varley book uh, called The Golden Globes, I think, where it's a pretty good long mystery. Uh, there's a big trial scene at the end, and and uh, we're given information about this trial where where that uh, gets the the hero out of trouble conveniently to end the novel by this law, this kind of r r frankly ridiculous law that is on the books that we've not been told about earlier in the book. So I think it's tough to combine those two well and Caves of Steel was one of the earliest to do it and probably still one of the best. Um, okay, a book that blends two or more genres. That was Samoa's then number six, do -si Does. Either a book you love that everyone seems to hate or a book you hate that everyone seems to love. I wish I could think of one I love that everyone seems to hate, but most of the books I love that people, 
you know, people just don't care about. I don't know if anybody, if I love a book that anybody hates, I wish, I hope I do. Um, I've read a lot of books that I like a lot that I think people misinterpret. There is a book that I hate that a lot of people seem to love, and I, I know other people hate it too, and and uh, I'm blocking the name of it right now. That uh, Blood Meridian. Oh God! It just, look, far be it for me to to say a book is pretentious and uh, pseudo intellectual and just the big fraud because people have said that about stuff I like too, you know, classics and stuff that I read, but it's Blood Meridian. It's just, there's a scene late in Blood Meridian, you know, I know it's supposed to be this intense, this intense, real gritty thing of the, of the West. There's a scene late in this book when, and it's not supposed to be realistic, there's a scene where they go in this, this, uh, trading post or something and the and the guy who runs the trading post has got a mentally ill person living there sitting in the corner you know kind of as a joke or something and and the the, the person sitting there in the corner the young man has human feces in his hair and like you know because it's got to be everything's got to be shocking and disgusting as 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 it can be and i just cannot see a person who's running a business trying to sell people, allowing someone in the store to hang out all day who's got human shit in his hair. Stupidest, but, and you know, oh, and this, this, the judge, this, this symbol of, of, uh, colonialism and the savage heart of man or something. And, you know, the, there's better books on the same subject that have punctuation and like uh, like uh, Butcher's Crossing is a fantastic book by John Williams I think it's, I always get that guy's name confused because he, he wrote Stoner um, such a simple name but Butcher's Crossing is a fantastic book about similar kind of setup this this young kid, um, you know, goes out west and he wants to make his fortune and stuff and he signs on with this lunatic to go on this buffalo skinning hunt and just, and the imagery in that is shocking and appalling and, and it's just a better written book. Just read that instead. And if you have read Blood Meridian and you love it, let me know what you think of uh, Butcher's Crossing. There's a movie a couple years ago with Nicholas Cage which I don't want to see because there's no way you can make a movie of that book. It's just so intense. It would just on on the screen it would just be you know just big piles and piles of, of gore. But when you're reading it and you know you really get the sense of being out there and surviving and greed and what it all ends up as. You know, and I would even put the. Uh, There's a book by Ardath Mayar, Jack Ketchum, I think it's called The Crossing. It's about a, it's a novella uh, about a cutthroat band of roaming the, the West. You know, it's very grim, dark, sort of Western. I think it's called The Crossing. I don't know, I might be conf They can't all have Crossing in the name, like Butcher's Crossing, but... I'll put I'll put that in there too, which is, that's be, that's better than than um, Blood Meridian. The third book in what's oh man I can't remember any of these book names. Uh, the third Lonesome Dove book, the prequel, where Call and and the other guy are, are young kids and they go off uh, and on their first Texas Ranger mission and they've got a lunatic boss you know who gets tortured by the Indians because his eyes cut off there's there's plenty of gory uh, horrific westerns and I just to me to me it was just the most pretentious thing I've ever read and I really hated it fortunately it was not that long and it, and I know some people say the road is better but I have no interest in reading anything by 
by that guy again. Um, Cormac McCarthy. Just like, you know, um, anyway, I just stopped talking about that. I really hate that book. It's a stupid book. Okay, so that was Dosey Doze. And number seven, Thin Mints, one of your all time favorite books. Okay, from Blood Meridian all the way over to one of my all time favorite books. I have so many favorites. I really don't have one favorite. What's the first book I read that would be my favorite? Am I going to have to skip this one? My all-time, one of your all-time favorite books. It's one of your all-time favorite books. I'll go, since since I've been talking about, since I was inspired by Michael K. Vaughn, I think I, I will go with Jungle Tales of Tarzan, which is a series of six, I think it's about six short stories about Tarzan of the Apes. Uh, it's the sixth book in the series, and this, the tales take place back before he was. Am I really doing Jungle Tales of Tarzan? Is one of my favorite books. I haven't read it in a while. I'm switching gears again. One of my favorite books is The Land That Time Forgot by Edgar Rice Burroughs. We'll stick with Burroughs, why not? And that's also one of my favorite adventure books. It's a trilogy, short trilogy, Land That Time Forgot, People That Time Forgot, and Out of Time's Abyss, which is uh, about these folks, uh, some Americans and some Germans on a German U-boat just right at the beginning of World War I, who go to this lost continent. And, you know, it's Burroughs, so... There's dinosaurs, which are cool, and then there's kind of a special sort of evolution on this continent that makes it different than just a dinosaur place like The Lost World or something like that. And it's a very cool book. I I really thought it was a step up for Burroughs other than the other Burroughs I'd read at the time that I was reading it, but I must have a more favorite book than that. Anyway, that's my uh, attempt to do the Girl Scout cookie tag probably should have thought about my answers more. One of my all-time favorite books is Shogun. I talked about that in a, re a previous video, though. I'm always kind of looking, when I go to read a big book, and which, that's why I don't read a lot of big books, because I'm always looking for one that's going to be as good as Shogun. And Lonesome Dove was one. Uh, War and Peace was one, definitely, you know, I mean, they're obviously not in the same class, you can't, because War and Peace means a lot to the world. Moby Dick is one, I don't know why I'm thinking about big books so much, but a lot of times when I'll, when I'll come across these modern fantasy writers and stuff, I really uh, can't get into them as much as I do into shorter books, just because I really think it's not every book learn, earns its length like those do. So anyway, I don't know, kind of petered out at the end. It says tag some. I'll try and tag a couple people here, but I'm pretty sure that everyone who wants to do it has done it. So if I tag you and you're like, oh, God, this again, I apologize. I'm only going to tag a few people that I know that, uh, that are kind of newer people for the most part that, that might have missed it. Okay, thanks BookTube. We'll talk again.